I've seen NFTs paying people passive income. Do you have any idea what that is? I talked about that for a little while. I said, what if I turn this company into a series of a thousand NFTs and each one of those NFTs allowed you to get a percentage of our profits? Mm, um, I was talking so about cool. this like six months ago with uh, Josh Terry. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, we talk pretty often. And uh, I was running it by him and he's like, ooh, you're stepping into securities range, bro. As soon as you that get popular, the SEC is going to fuck you up. Yeah. And so I didn't put a whole lot more um, thought into it, but I think there's a way, Austin. So you finally started your own business. Invest for the long term. And I'll show you exactly how. Be good to future you. Austin, I am super happy that we get to talk again. I've been looking forward to this. And uh, I just figured we could wrap a little bit about what you have going on. You can tell us about some of the things that you're working on right now that you're most excited about. And then I can ask you some questions because let's be honest, dude, like I am not, it's not my wheelhouse. Investing and understanding that whole, it's not my wheelhouse. And I'd want to ask someone who's an expert in that field. So <sighs> first, tell me what's going on in your life and what you're most excited about. Um, so right now it's sort of still like being, okay. So I think I told you about the podcast, right? With King Batch, where we sat down with, uh, music artists, athletes, and celebrities about how they made their money and where they're investing it. Now, uh, we, we sort of had this idea of the podcast of making a podcast, King Batch and I back in February of last year. And, uh, it was great. We were going to do it. And so we finally put, you know, pen to paper and figured it all out. Uh, and then in the month of July, we filmed it all. We, we went to, you know, we, we were with Jason Derulo, Jordan Belfort, Hannah Stocking, Jalil White, Mark Doner, Ari Sandel, what Adam Waheed. Dude, dope people. Super cool people. 14 awesome, incredible people. Lindsay Palos, Chris Camillo. The, the, it goes on Wonderful. forever. And that's incredible and really excited about it. And right now, though, we're just figuring out, like, okay, what's distribution look like? How do we get to market it? How do we build up hype around it? Who do we get excited about this? Who's our target person that we really want to, like, make sure that they understand this podcast exists where are we going to be looking for advertisers to plug in their ideas and products for example adam waheed's talking about he's never begun to invest in a real estate because he doesn't know he doesn't understand it very well he doesn't know how to even begin that's where you say hey this is fundrise or this is dorvest or this is whatever the other you know advertising company is that we've obviously vetted and used personally i'm a fundrise guy but dorvest is awesome too um, but it's like, you know, this is a company that can begin to answer those questions because I mean, when Adam Waheed saying those things and you're like, okay, this guy's like in his twenties, I don't, I'm in my twenties too. Like, I don't understand real estate. And then when a company can come in and say, Hey, you know, you're like, this is all you need to really understand. We have more resources to learn more, but we, you know, it's a hands-off approach. Like, let us do that for you. It just, you know, it seems like a, a sort of out of the box solution. So we're figuring all that stuff out right now. So you're yeah, talking to celebrities and using their questions to advertise for specific companies that provide solutions? Sort of, yeah. So generally speaking, we're talking with celebrities to get the stigma around talking about money and investing Good. just like Good. moved away, right? It's like we want to create, we create this podcast so we can begin to inspire everyday people because everyday people watch and listen to these, you know, artists, celebrities, and athletes um, and to inspire everyday people to begin to just invest responsibly right? It's like, what is real estate investing? What is the stock market? What is small business? What is like, how do I do these things? Adam Waheed, you've got, you've got, you're into like Virgin Hotel. Like, how'd you get into Virgin Hotel? Or Jason Drill is like in a pizza company. Like, why do you like pizza? What's like the food business? Like, how do I begin to approach that as a, as a, someone who's never thought about this before? And how do I begin to maybe start my own small business or think through companies that I should be investing into? And so it's really just like, Hey, if Jason Drulo, my favorite music artist, or if Adam Waheed, my favorite comedian, is investing into real estate or pizza companies. Maybe I can like begin to think more about the, how I can do that too. Like that's so cool. Or if Hannah Stocking is talking about how she just bought her first house at 32, maybe I shouldn't feel bad about not buying my first house until I'm 30 something as well. I love Hannah Stocking. Like right. I, I, all the pressure for me to buy a house and and she's crushing it and she just bought hers and she's in her 30s, right? Or well, whatever that looks like. I don't know. I don't know if Hannah's really that old, but what I'm saying is like <laughs> giving those examples of inspiring people to begin to just talk about money, think about money in a responsible way that's approachable, digestible and just just scalable right i just want everyone thinking about responsible investing toward their futures i mean you're in your early 20s right yeah 25 well okay. mid 20s i guess okay okay and but when was it that you made the decision to go to school for finance though like i um, mean you've started investing much younger than that 
Yeah, so I started investing when Dave Ramsey came to my high school and <laughs> convinced us that a Roth IRA <laughs> is the smartest thing you could do. And Hell I was like, yeah. yo, this is dope. So we talked about it, I learned about it, and then I quickly realized that I need to open one up. And then I was like, okay, well, I can't do it till I'm 18, no problem. And so then I went and got my Roth IRA through Betterment when I turned 18. I began auto investing into that. But then when I got into college, once I started taking these you know, classes in accounting and economics and finance and all these other different things, I then began to realize and understand better how these companies on the stock market operate, how they make money, how they're taxed, where their you know, expenses come from, what the accounting procedures look like against that, how to read a balance sheet, how to create a balance sheet, how to create an income statement. Like that's the thing. It's it's like it's so fun to begin to look at new companies and invest, but unless you know how to read about those companies in a way that's like educated, which is understanding accounting, right? Accounting is the language of of finance and and, and just business, right? Right. And so not understanding that to the fullest extent as I had until I was in college was sort of hard. But then once I started taking those classes and understanding the problems that, that they were solving and, and a better understanding how I can conceptualize that and, and explain to other people, that's when I get really excited about personal finance and I, investing. I like that. And, and yeah. not, if you read, if you can learn how to read a balance sheet and a profit and loss, profit to earnings ratio, then like those kind of reports, it also translates to your own business too. I yeah. mean, it's super important. If you can't read a P&L, like, how do you know how much money your business is making, let alone 100%. on a business you're investing in too? Now, exactly. one thing I did want to touch on, you mentioned that couldn't get a Roth IRA until 18, which is normally true. Mm -hmm. There is a way to get it mm -hmm. younger than 18. For example, my 12-year-old daughter has a Roth IRA. I remember this. I remember yes. this. This she is so is cool. Yeah, I remember Custodial Roth IRA. Exactly. See, I and that's what's funny, man. My parents never really understood investing. So my dad mm -hmm. was like the kind of guy who's like, yeah, just – retirement account, something like that. I hire a guy. I'm not really worried about it. And so and it's funny too. Like he's, I won't honestly, he's like 75 now. He turned 76 in two weeks. And he's like, yeah, I just saw that, you know, Netflix's stock is up because of a TV show that they're doing squid game. I'm like, yeah, it is like, that's, that's something he's like Netflix. That's a cool company, right? Is there a good, is that a good stock? Like, it's like, it's just so funny because like like I can like go, I could, I could talk to you at nauseum about like Netflix's business model, how they make money and the growth levers internationally and like like the margins on that like everything and he's like yeah it's like a tv thing right like should I buy the <laughs> stock you know it's like it's just some people just totally are like high level understanding of it and sometimes those people are the, the most fun to talk to about these things but so long story short though my parents were never really into investing and things of that nature so i didn't have a cool dad like you to, to open me up a custodial didn't roth either. ira so your daughter's crushing it bro yeah. Yeah, uh, both of our parents are the same. We didn't learn from them in terms of finance and money. We had to learn it on our own in our own way. Your catalyst was uh, Dave Ramsey. My catalyst was a combination of my grandmother and uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. And so mm. it's really interesting how those things caused us to break the mold. Well, so what's weird is Dave Ramsey was a big catalyst, but I want to say the biggest catalyst. So back in 2006, I think my dad was like 62 or 63. Um, he retired. He's like, I'm, 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 I'm out hanging it up. I'm doing my thing all as well. Um, and so, you know, he, he retired in 2006 and 2007 and we all know what happened in 2008. And so whenever that happened, he had to go back to work. He found a job. We lived in Tennessee at the time. He, he had to like find a job ASAP, found one in Colorado. I had to move across the country right in the middle of high school to like go do like it, it upended my entire life. Damn. And I was like, how can this one thing that I, what the fuck is the stock market? How is this one thing causing me and my family to sell our house, move halfway across the country so my dad can work? Like, what is this? And so I, I, I then made it my like just focus to understand every single nuance and part of it so that will never happen to me and my children like again in the future and so it's like i just want to be like so prepared i want to understand it where i can have like these you know uh j j just sort of risk um levers that i can pull in case something's happening like, i just i just want to understand it in a way that allows me to, to to make action before something that big is forced upon you know a group of people yeah you don't want to be kneecapped by fucking black swan events and shit Yep. We got to yep. get financially immortal, Austin. And the only way is to diversify your income streams and have so many different types of assets giving you money on a monthly basis that you can't get I wanna, recapped by that. I want to ask you about that, man. I, I've seen, and I'm not sure how, how much you know this asset class, but I've seen NFTs paying people passive income. Do you have any idea what that is? I talked about that for a little while. I said, what if I turn this company into a series of a thousand NFTs and each one of those NFTs allowed you to get a percentage of our profits? 
Mm, um, I was talking so about this cool. like six months ago with uh, Josh Terry. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, we talk pretty often. And uh, I was running it by him and he's like, ooh, you're stepping into security's range, bro. As soon as you that get popular, true. the SEC is going to fuck you up. Yeah. And so I didn't put a whole lot more um, thought into it, but I think there's a way, Austin. Well, what I've seen, I think I saw this on Twitter. I think there's something called like mutant crypto cats. Mutant crypto cat. Let me just look at passive income here. I wonder if they on. share a percentage of what their uh, their fees are with their members. It's kind of like it how some be. some cryptocurrencies burn tokens when transaction fees, and then spread half of those burns right. to the wallets right. that hold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing mutant cats as a uh, as an NFT project that pays APY. Interesting. Dude, we're in such an exciting time, dude. It has moved so fast, so fast. Dude. Crazy, bro. Dude, so fast. I just looked at my wallet today and I have some V friends and Gary Vaynerchuk dropped me a couple thousand dollar NFT. Are you serious? You have some yep. V friends? Oh yeah, I've got four of them. I'm going dude. To VCon. I'm going to VCon, dude. Let's go. That's so cool, bro. Yeah, I got a, I got rented a, a house in Minneapolis. And so right right by the convention center, it's going to be a great time. I'm really when excited. When is it? Uh, in May 2022. Is it only for people that have V friends or can you buy tickets? You have to have a V friend. I need to buy a V friend. You need a V friend. Right now, there um, there's a little dip. I would recommend getting one sooner than later. But yeah, okay. I I uh, I am super pumped. I'm going with a couple of my buddies, my business partner, uh, my CPA and stuff. It's it's going to be a ton of fun. Behind that door is my closet, but also in my closet are a bunch of books that I don't keep like that, just out uh -huh. in the open. And one of them is, uh, gosh, which book is it by Gary V? One of his books. It's the one with the yellow cover on it. But anyway, he signed it. I got. I'm all you know, big Gary V guy. Love Gary Vee. He's incredible. That's cool, man. That's a signed copy. Oh, <sighs> if you ever want to trade that for anything, let me know because I'm interested. We'll in that. I am a huge we'll Gary Vee fan. Okay, so there's a question I've been wanting to ask you. It's been on my mind for actually a couple months, and um, I haven't had the opportunity to really ask it to you. So, and I don't think there's a wrong or right answer, but I got I got to know what you think, dude. So a lot of people like Tony Robbins, who wrote Money Master the Game. Ramit Sethi, who wrote, you know, I will teach you to be rich. You know, there's a lot of people, even Wall Street studies have shown that when you try to pick individual stocks, you just can't, you, it, it doesn't beat like just buying the whole market. Like there's just like, uh, you know, the whole study about monkey throwing darts at the stock charts and, and mm -hmm. you know, beating Wall Street experts. Like, yeah. what do you say to, to that kind of stuff? What are your thoughts on it? I think that i totally agree i totally agree first off i i'm not at all gonna over here you know stand and argue that individual stock picking beats out the index funds over the long term but what i think is interesting is two things one the average person shouldn't be picking individual stocks because like we talked about average people don't understand accounting average people don't understand what income statements are pnls and things of that nature right and so like two pick a stock you need to know damn well what their financials look like you need to know very well like what their business is and so that to me is just like yes if you're an average person please stick to your index funds please stick to you know e or etfs or whatever right like, like a target is, date retirement fund or something 100 sure, okay um like stick to that right but then what i also think about too it's like and this, this kind of goes into chris camillo and i'm not sure if you've heard of him but he's this incredible guy who created a company called ticker tags and sold it to an investment bank a couple of years after he created it. But what it does is it scrapes Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, any other social places where people are talking about things, subjects, keywords, things of that nature. And it scrapes these platforms to figure out user sentiment, customer sentiment about specific companies, right? So they identified LaCroix was taken over the world back in like 2000 and like, what was that, 17? Everyone wanted LaCroix. So Chris said, okay, cool, our, our software figured this out. It's pretty obvious to us. And so what he did is he bought stock in the company who owns LaCroix before Wall Street understood what this looked like for the company, right? And so another example of this was Chipotle. The same on other things were happening. No one knew what to do with Chipotle. So he shorted Chipotle stock or bought, you know, put options um, before Wall Street was able to really price it into their stock. And so I'm not saying that people should be single stock picking off of social arbitrage ideas like that, but I think that the people that should be, you know, investing into single stocks 
need to understand where the world's going in the future and need to be very self-aware of what they're, where they're spending their money and what they're doing. So what that means to me is like, I shop at Target. I feel like not just as a consumer, well, there's two reasons, right? Let's use this first one though. I shop at Target. I understand Target's business. I know a lot of other people also do that. I want to own Target stock, right? Um, like that's an easy way to like find a single stock. And, and what, what's frustrating those people are like, yeah, what's like that penny stock or a pharmaceutical company or a, a EV company or like some bullshit no one's ever heard of. And I, I, I can't talk toward a specific one because I don't know. But like there's so many companies out there that are like literally no revenue, but they're trading at whatever net. Like those unfortunately are the companies that just fuck people when they're like picking their single stocks. I think if you're going to pick single stocks, Google's up 100% year to date, right? Pick Google. We all know Google. We all use YouTube. But like, that's a single stock. It's like, dude, yes, of course you should own stock in Google, right? Of course you should own stock in Amazon. Or, and I'm not saying like it's going to outperform the market, but and that kind of goes into my second point here. It's too. It's like, as a consumer, maybe this is like my mentality. But as a consumer, I want to be an owner as well. You know what I'm uh, saying? If I can go and shop, and that's what Griffin does very well. Griffin.com, um, G-R-I-F-I-N. It's this company that allows you to look at your bank statements, say, "Hey, you you shop at you shop at uh, Kroger, you also shop at Target, you also shop at Amazon, and you also shop at Starbucks. Every time you swipe your card there, we're going to tack on an extra dollar to your transaction and buy a dollar worth of their stock. And I've got 700 bucks sitting in my Griffin account." Because I just, you know, it's it's it just allows me to spend my money where I want to, and now I'm owning the stock, and it's up. You know, what I'm it's like I want everyone to realize you should not just be a consumer; you should also be an owner. And then also, as it relates to like investing in single stocks, yes, do it for your own good in the sense that you understand what the company is and how they make money, and you're a customer. Don't do it if you're like, yeah, my buddy Bill told me about this pharmaceutical stock that's going to go up 100x. It's going to be great and it's trading for four cents. Like, fuck that. That's how you lose your money, right? And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then stick to your index funds. Stick to those ETFs, stick to those target date retirement funds, whatever that looks like. I totally agree like that, that you know, those are absolutely needed for 95% of the population. Okay. Yeah, dude, that completely answers my question. And that was solid, dude. More than I actually hoped for. I think that's pretty cool, dude. And, and I also think it's funny too. It's like, as it relates to like my single stock picking, it's, it, to me, it's like a fun game, bro. Like, it's no, like, yes, you know, it's, 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 it's it sucks losing money, but it's also, it's, I don't see like making the money. I like being right versus making the money more, if that makes sense. So it's like, oh, yeah, all right, guys, <laughs> firm stock is trading at, you know, 60 bucks a share right now. They're growing revenue by 70%. The forward gross profit multiples are really low right now. You know, th we know this company is gonna be massive. It shouldn't be trading right now. I think it's undervalued. Like let's like, and then that's why, you know, my Substack or Patreon goes out and I'm like, hey guys, this is what I think. I'm publishing this to the internet right now. So I can look back at it in four months and either say I'm right or I'm wrong. And I've been right luckily more times than I've been wrong recently. But it's like, hey guys, remember when I said a firm was a cool stock at $62? It just closed today at 150. Let's fucking go. Like I was right. I love that. And I don't really care about the money that's made, but it's like, I love to see that. I just like, it's like a game for me, right? And that's what makes me happy is, 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 is figuring out what that game is and learning though from the mistakes that I've made playing this game so I can make a better, I guess, decision in the future. It's an intellectual sport, man. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It really yeah. is. And it feels so good when you're right because some people are like, whoa, how'd you do that? How do you know that? And I'm like, man, it's so common sense. Like, it's so easy to just like look around and say, oh yeah, that's a cool company. They're growing well. Their total adjustable market makes sense. They're operating in the secular growth trend of uh, buy now, pay later. More and more people are going to begin using it. Like, this is sweet. Oh, this partner with Amazon? Love it. Partner with Target? Love it. Partner with Walmart and Shopify? Love it. Like, dude, this is a no-brainer, right? And so it's like, it's just, it's so fun to find these little things. And like you said, it's an intellectual game. I mean, it's just, it keeps me going, man. I love it. Dude, I dig that. What are you working on right now? Because I, I, I know you spend time on your Patreon and stuff and you get, you really dig into certain companies and, and you make detailed reports on them. I mean, you just launched a newsletter that I've been enjoying on Substack. But right. like, what are you working on right now? What company are you researching at the moment? Yeah, so actually, um, there's a comp there, there's a website called unhedged.com, and me and their CEO, his name's Chris, he used to run a hedge fund back in New York uh, like 15 years ago, and he's very, very smart, such a smart guy. And so what we do is like once a week, we sit down and we're just like, hey, look, let's find a stock that, that is interesting to us. And we've been doing this for the past like six or seven weeks now, where we just say like, here's a stock we think is interesting. Here's why we think it's interesting. We're just bringing it to y'all's attention. Let us know what you think. The company that I just did a lot of research on, and we're going to host a live stream this Sunday, Chris and I, to like talk more with our audience about why we think it's interesting, 
is Amplitude. A-M-P-L is the ticker. Um, they just IPO'd like two weeks ago. Long story short, what they do, you know, every single company is digital. If it's a, a digital interface inside a Ford F-150, if it is the virtual you know, digital checkout at Walmart, if it's inside your cash app, like it's all digital interfaces with people, right? What if there was a company that had that could be running in the source code in the background that allowed every single interaction that takes place on this digital interface to be recorded and put behind trend lines and deciphered and understood at scale with over 900 billion points of information of data collected every single month. So that's what Amplitude does for 1200 companies around the US, I'm sorry, around the world, uh, with 36% of those companies being outside of the US and 26 of the Fortune 100 companies, including Walmart, including Ford, including Squares, include, yeah, and including all these really dope companies use this so they get better analytics on their product to better understand how we can make our product more usable, more profitable, and to, to drive user intent to make sure users understand what they're doing, to make sure that, that we're able to like portray our story as, as accurately as possible to them. That is an incredible idea to me. I love the company. And to me, it's like, okay, if every single company out there that is digital consumer facing, that really matters, right? 26 of the Fortune 100s, this is Walmart, this is like all the big companies are using this data and analytics platform for their digital products. It just, it's like a no brainer why tons more people won't use it around the world because everything is digital, right? Right. Think about just like the thought that so many digital products are made every single year. There are, I'd, I'd argue, billions of people around the world that yeah, billions that use a digital product like YouTube, like Facebook, like what's, you know, just like all, there's so many billions of people around the world that, that use digital products. Wouldn't you want the data around how they use those digital products so you can better shape your digital product in the future? Perfect. You do. That's Amplitude. And a bunch of, you know, 12, like I said, 1200 companies are already using that for that. Dude, it's, it's so cool. It's like, it, it, and the thing too, it's like, what's funny now if we want to get into like actual price projections and ideas like that, Snowflake, which is a data analytics company, but it's like for massive data lakes and massive just, I am not. I mean, I think you've probably heard of Snowflake. Uh -huh. They are growing revenue at about 70%, 60 to 70% annually going forward projected. And their gross profit margin on that revenue is about 68 to 72%, depending Dang, on the Dang, dude. Right? So it's like, you know, 65% <laughs> revenue growth and 70% margins. They are trading at 20 times next year's revenue. So I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to 4X in their valuation, which would put their stock price at $200 a share. Right now it's at 55. But what I am saying is like, if you compare it to a very similar company around data, who is growing at similar speeds with similar customers, it just, it's like a no brainer. So that to me is like, what's just really exciting. That's the company I'm looking at right now. I did a nice little analysis on them. Actually last night on LinkedIn, uh, what is it? Amplitude's chief marketing officer saw my sub stack, posted it to her LinkedIn and called me out and was like, this is so great. Thank you for like teaching people about our company. And like all their like employees looked at it and commented on it. It was so cool. Dude. Yeah, dude, like it's wild. But like in actuality, man, like that's the kind of shit I love. It's like, I just like to find these little nuggets. He's like, because like, dude, it's a $5 billion company. That's so small in the grand scheme of things, right? Netflix is 250 billion. Snowflake is, I want to say like north of uh, 90 billion. Coinbase is like 90 billion. You know, all these big, 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 big companies, a small little $5 billion company is powering all these massive heavy hitters. Let me invest in the company powering everyone else. So as those companies do well, the small company gets brought up with them, right? Makes sense. Infrastructure. You're investing infrastructure. in infrastructure, dude. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's huge. The infrastructure, especially with the way things are trending right now, with the way things are changing and our digital environment. I could argue that the my, my digital world is more important and people know me better in that than in the physical world. Yeah. Right? No, I'd argue 100% on that one. Yep. Like people can even fucking look at my the NFTs that I have and look at my Instagram and all the shit that we have and the content we put out. And But you've never seen the fucking art in my living room. That's true. And uh, I don't know, man, it's just, that's just one, yeah, just one aspect of it. But yeah, things are changing. Things are changing in the digital world. Have you done any um, looking into any metaverses or any digital worlds like that at all? So not a lot, right? You know, you've got Roblox, you've got Facebook with what they're trying to do. But generally speaking, I haven't really. Um, I'm sure there are some, a couple of really cool companies out there. And I, I even think that there's an ETF, an, a metaverse ETF that is that is launched. <laughs> That's cool. Um, but but I, I personally haven't been looking too much into it. I think, I think what's interesting is that, so with the metaverse, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think people who are in and using and excited about the metaverse are under the age of 25. 
right? So I'd say people would like to call them nine year olds to 25 year olds, nine year olds to 25 year olds, even call it majority are probably under the age of 20 because there are all a bunch of kids on the, the Minecraft and Roblox and, and on and maybe not Facebook, but you know what I'm saying, right? And so I would argue those are the people who are really experiencing the metaverse. And for the companies who are creating for the metaverse and operating within this secular growth trend, their now biggest worry is how do we now get money from people that don't have a lot of money, which are these 13, 17, 22 year olds, right? And like, yes, you got the Robux and like those are Rob Roblox, Ro I don't know, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like yeah, you got those okay. things and those are working and the, yeah, I get that. But two, it's like, we know the metaverse is gonna be here. It's just gonna take the, the, the user demographic a good five years before they, they have that first job or they're in high school and they're spending money or they're out of college now and they can you know, afford stuff. And so like, for me, that's the only like big observation that I've begun to make with the metaverse. It's like, yes, it's there. Yes, people know it's gonna come, but like monetizing against it right now is a little hard because the people who use it don't have the most money. But um, yeah, dude, I'm here for it. I think it's cool. When I think, go ahead. Well, I was going to segue because I was going to ask you like, because I I've, I see you make a ton of content still and you do, um, a, you put out a ton of stuff for your Patreon and, and your Substack and everything else that you do for your community, as well as all the other projects that you're involved in. How do you prioritize and split up your time? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, so Substack. Uh, so yeah, so so we've migrated off of Patreon onto some Substack 100. percent Okay. So Substack is my biggest priority. I think right now I've got about 3,000 people hanging out with us over there, um, including a lot of I guess cool people that read it and post it on the LinkedIn's like like this one, the lady uh, from Amplitude. But Substack is is definitely a big priority for me on a daily basis. Is making sure I'm publishing the most valuable content at scale with actionable insights for people that want to see them. Uh, second is uh, probably making sure that I'm like being true to the ad deals that I've, that I've committed to, right? So that's like, hey, Fundrise, hey, Public, hey, Betterment, um, making sure that I kind of have a, a content calendar and when those publishing looks like and how quickly I need to get that out. And then I think finally, it's like now, if, once I've done that and I still have spare time, like now I can kind of focus on posting new content to my TikTok. And I'm trying to get better at, at, at like posting every single day again. I used to post every single day uh, right. last summer for like 90 days. Yeah, it was terribly hard. Um, and I got a little burnt out and I was like, all right, I'm not going to post on the weekends anymore. And it's like, all right, I'm not going to post on Fridays anymore. And it's like, yeah. and I remember when I was like, all right, I haven't posted in two weeks. Fuck me. Like, you know, it's like, I gotta, I gotta be better. And so, um, I think I posted three times last week. Let me check real quick here. So I posted, um, yeah, about one, two, three times, four times last week and, uh, three times this week. So I'm trying to get to that three, four, five range again. So so when you're posting, is it that you sitting it down in front of the camera, recording it, doing the hashtags and posting it yourself? Or do you have a team behind you to help you? It's all me, bro. I have no team. I have Christian. I mean, he's definitely a team, I guess. You know, you can say that, but he's he's one person, right? Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Yeah, I was yeah, meeting yeah. with Malka and Malka, uh, Malka Media, that company we were talking about earlier. And they're like, yeah, so like uh, walk us through like how many members are in your team and like what they all do. And, on, and it was me and Christian on the phone. I'm like, you're looking at him. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like we script everything we do all the ad deals the negotiations we film everything we edit everything like like we are the ones that are creating all the templates all the thumbnails we create the distribution channels we like we are the like we're a two-man team that does probably enough for like seven people to like be full-time employed um but we do it in such a way that makes us happy and excited because like we know exactly i'm not saying like i like micromanage but like we know exactly what we want to do and exactly how things are going to come out because like, we're so synced up christian and i are um about those things and it, like it's just perfect every single time and we're able to just crank through stuff quickly effectively and just just in such a way that that makes sense for the two of us and it works interesting dude i hit my limit on that stuff oh a while ago but so what i i, I handled things a little differently i saw i was curious how your content flow was because i see you put out a lot of stuff and i had someone comment the other day to me and like dude i see you posting every day i know you're busy and i'm like dude I ain't posting every day. Someone else is posting for me. Like the fuck? Dude, I started writing down, uh, I started documenting how I like to edit my stuff. Hashtags mm -hmm. I like to use, how, where I like to post, how I like to post my videos, how I like to edit them. And I started creating SOPs, just standard operating procedures all built out in Notion files. Mm -hmm. I started linking Google Drive folders in there. And uh, so when you're done editing a content, a piece of content, put it in this folder. You know, grab new raw videos from this folder. 
place thumbnails in this folder. This is how we edit them. Here's the aspect ratio. Here's the size. Here's where they go. And I started creating flows and then I started plugging in VAs slowly. Video VAs? editors. Yeah, vi ah. virtual assistants. Yeah, ah. most of them from Colombia, Africa, other places yeah. where I'm paying them six to eight dollars an hour and they're getting a badass wage. Oh, yeah. For their country, but it's also affordable for me. Totally. And I said, just just follow the rules. Just follow the rules. Just follow the rules. And I started detailing out the rules. And dude, I got some time back. I love that, dude. I Oh, my God. I need to do that so bad. I love back. that. And because you guys have such a detailed workflow and you and Christian are so in sync, like it would be so easy just to turn on the camera and record how you talk and then translate that into text. And now mm. you have an SOP that not only can you plug someone into, but those become valuable. Those become company assets that you can then turn around and sell or become part of the overall value of your company. I love that, dude. I didn't even think about that. I need to do that for sure. I read it in a book. What it's book? Not my, it's not my idea. Traction. Traction. Yeah. Do you have any good yeah. book ideas that I need to be reading, man? I don't. I feel like Bro, I've been kind of shit the bed on. I crush about books. two bucks. Two books a week. Get like, the fuck I go out fucking of here, hard on books, dude. When do you read? When do you have time? What's your day to day look like? I don't read. I listen. Ah, I okay. speed it up. Like I put it on like 1.4, 1.5. So like one yeah. and a half times. And I feel like I'm in the matrix downloading a book into my brain. Because here's the thing. When you're reading, your your hands are occupied, your ears and your eyes. You can't be fucking driving and reading at the yeah. same time. Yeah. Um, or cooking and doing the dishes, whatever. But you plug in your headphones, dude, and you just go into the world and let someone tell you what's up. And that's what I've really liked. And so, so much so that my audiobooks have become one of the people, one of my five, you know, tribe members that shapes who I am. You know, Ooh, business coach, I love that. audio books, and then my circle, my core group of, of yeah. people. So I throw books at people like prescriptions all the time when they come to me. So what's so, the, um, what's, what's the app that you might use to do that? I use audible and audiobooks.com. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Audible's Amazon uh -huh. audiobooks is separate, but yeah, between those two, I can pretty much find everything. And so when I wake up in the morning, I don't check my phone, dude. I cannot do it. It'll put me in an instant state of anxiety and panic. Like, fuck, I gotta go. So I don't, I get dressed and then I do a little Wim Hof breathing exercises to get myself Love centered. that, man. Love that. Uh, I do a little, a light workout, some stretching. I have my coffee and then I open up my journal on my phone and I plan the rest of my day. And yeah, it takes me like 45 minutes to get all that shit done. But that daily private victory is important to me. I learned about it in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. And dude, it just puts me in a good state of mind. It puts me, it gives me that win. I start off a day with a win already. In what a time do you wake state. up? Like eight, maybe eight thirty. Got it. Yeah, got it. Not super early. I'm the um, same. I'm about like seven thirty, eight o'clock. Yeah, it's just important for me to like, no matter what time I wake up, what I'm doing is I have to have that first win. Mm -hmm. I have to have it. So that's funny, man, that you mentioned that. I used to be terrible about making my bed and cleaning my room. I don't know why. You know, laugh at me if you want. My mom always was upset about it, but I could never make my bed in the morning or clean my room. I just didn't care. I, I was like, I'm just going to mess it up when I get into bed anyway, you know? But then, like, what forced me to start making my bed was the fact that I have my camera here. I don't want people to see that I have it all, you know, a terrible <laughs> bed. And so I woke up and I realized, like, okay, I'm going to make my bed. And I was like, dang, that felt pretty good. Like, I, I, I did something today already. Like, that's, yep. that's a good fucking feeling. And then now, every single time I wake up, I don't make it up just yet. I go get my breakfast, get it all figured out. Then I come back to my room and I make up my bed and I clean my room, tidy it up a little bit. And I'm like, all right. Let's get this fucking day going. I yep. just, I totally agree to you. Some of that small little win right when you wake up feels so good. Drew that, dude. And how good does it feel to cross shit off on your to-do list and your journal oh, and what you're yes. doing? So you just, yep. You're like, oh, dang. You look back, you can reflect. These journals are like time capsules, bro, of like our lives. Dude, One I day, know. these are going to be things that are going to be scanned, put into a digital space so that people can look back on how we created our lives. It's documentation. Like it's crazy. Yeah, I wrote these. Uh, here we go. Ready? Everything I want to do in 2021. This was January, right? It's like 10 months ago. And I, the biggest thing I have here that uh, it says escape competition by creating authenticity. That's my favorite Naval uh, Ravikant. Oof, that's a good one. And uh, it's just like, I gotta, I just, I guess, gotta stay true to like what that is, right? It's like, just never forget like that's, the, like that's what that is. And just, I don't know. And like, and then another good one by Russ. Uh, the rapper, I don't know if he made this up or what, but he, he I saw it from him and he said, um, don't let your ambition rob you of your current blessings. So it's like, don't let 
what you want to get done and what you want to focus on and what you just want to grind out, rob you from the fact you fucking crushed it. You need to like absorb that. You need to be happy and content with how well you've done. You were, I mean, like I compare myself to October this time last year, not to get the numbers on if we're still being recorded or not, but it's October okay to talk about time. money. All right, cool. So this time last year in October, I had the biggest month ever. I, including the about $4,200 I was making for my job, I cleared $13,000 in revenue from the ad stuff I was doing on TikTok, from Patreon. Like, I was like, I made $13,000 this month between my full time job and my side gig. This is fucking crazy, right? Like, it's just like bonker shit. I'll do $90,000 this month. Like, this yep. month, I'll, I'll, have, I'll, I'll almost clear six figures. That's like, one you month. go from one, one yeah, in and, and, and just 12 months, like that, with that, it's just like, what? fuck dude like and i'm like oh you know it's six feet maybe when can it be a million a month like 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 and you're, it's just like don't don't worry about that look back and be like look what the fuck you've done like that's just what gets me so excited you know there's something to be said for that man there's something you said that's so easy to lose sight of it once we get there it's like what's mm -hmm. next but yeah. you mentioned goals earlier goals are super powerful dude i go hard on goals i get weird with goals my wife and i sat down the other day for four hours we had some coffee together before the kids woke up and we listed out a bunch of different categories of our life. Health, body, friends, finance, professional, philanthropy, you know, kids, marriage, I'm relationship. I'm so jealous of your we, marriage. We, we oh listed my God. out all these different things, right? And then we wrote down, okay, what would a perfect life be like in every single category? And so we wrote down everything that would make our lives perfect in those categories. And now we have a whole roadmap of where we want to go. Now we know exactly where to go. Now we know exactly what to work on, exactly what decisions to make, and exactly where we're headed. And it was a powerful exercise, dude. If you ever get the chance to fuck around with that stuff, it is worth it. It's worth taking dude, the time to map send it me that, that's the, the topics. I love to think yeah. through what those topics look like. Um, wow, that's so inspiring, man. I think, I, cause that's what's frustrating sometimes too. And I'm not frustrating, maybe I should be more empathetic, but it's like people drift through life. People drift through life, not just bouncing off, doing that. Like they, they don't say- They're rudderless ships. Yep. They're like, I don't, they, 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 instead of saying, I'm going to take this log, turn it into a canoe and a paddle and fucking go where I want to go. They take the log, they drop it exactly how it is on the river, hold on to it and just let it take them where it's going to go. And so it's like being, and, and sometimes, you know, and if that's make you happy, fucking love you for it. You know what I'm saying? Like drift and do your thing. I love you. You got it. Happiness is what, what we're all going for. Right. But for me, it's like, I can't drift because I need to know I'm a planner sometimes. I got to know what's going on. I got to know where I'm going. I got to feel what's, what's, I just, yeah, man, that's crazy. Good for you guys. Mine. So I, I want to circle back really quick. You asked about books. If you could talk to a magic genie right now, unlimited wishes are out of the question and you could have three wishes come true right now, what would they be? And then, yeah, I'm just out of curiosity. It can be simple things like I would want to learn how to do this or I would like to understand this or I wish I could be here. Things like that. Oh, man, that's a good question. I think so for me, something that would really impact my life in a positive way is um, I want to get my mom, my dad and my sister all in the same state again. So I think the first thing I'd do is be like, buy some sort of couple houses where we can all just like be in the same neighborhood. You're just in the same city. So that's probably the first one. Um, oh yeah. Respect I think that. the second one I would do would be, fuck man, I'm so happy right now. It's I, 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 I love the fact that I don't have like three wishes off the bat. That's okay. I'm just like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm so content with where everything's at. Let's circle back to the books though, because you said, do you have any book recommendations? I have a lot of book recommendations. Yeah. Um, and it just depends on what category. What are you looking for? Where do you want to I, start? So that's the thing. It's like, I think that a lot of books, self-help books per se, are super just like, I knew that, you know, yeah. like why, why you know, like, dude. yeah. So it's like, I, are there any books out there that you were like, okay, this was not what I was expecting and actually was fucking mind blowing. Like, I'm so glad I read this book. Yep. Yep. There's a handful of them. Yeah. Tribe of Millionaires was one of them to taught me that you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time around. And that really started to cement in my brain, like, oh my God, dude. And I can look back at my life. Anyways, very powerful lessons and very fun read. You know, just to, as, as far as mindset books go, there was Magic of Thinking Big, um, mm. which is everything you'd hope Think and Grow Rich would be. But Think and Grow Rich fucking sucks. I can't believe they made a movie out of it. That book was garbage. Mm. But think, uh, Magic of Thinking Big was like the replacement for that. But then there's stuff like Traction, where it teaches you how to build systems 
and understand that your business is a system and you need to work on it instead of in it. And it shows you how to do those kinds of things and put um, systems in place, turn yeah. it into a fran franchisable model so that anyone can run it and it has value. One of the ones that had the most impact on me recently was Profit First. Super good. It's a by Mike Michalowicz. It's a different way of accounting for your business. Instead of just looking at your bank account and trying to figure out, okay, I have this much money I can spend. Um, how much money do I have coming in? How much do I need to set? It's like the envelope method of accounting for your business. It teaches you to put some aside in a profit account, an owner's comp account, ex operating expenses, taxes, so that your business pays your taxes and your business has profits and it teaches you how to manage the money in a more simple way. That one was I like really that. cool. I like that. I think that's been sort of the biggest hurdle myself. And don't get me wrong, like, you know, got the degree in finance and economics, but it's like, that's been my biggest hurdle is like going from deciphering and understanding successful businesses, balance sheets and income statements to building my own from scratch Yep. and seeing money yep. come in, thinking through where it has to go, when it has to go there. What, you know, I just, I like that. What's that one called yeah. again, that book? Profit First by Mike Profit McCallum. First. Yeah, I just okay. threw a, um, a YouTube video up on a review on it because I thought it was so great. But like, I, I learned a hard lesson this last year. I pulled a bunch of money out of Scorch Marker to buy a house. And I'm like, oh. okay, yeah, it'll keep coming in, you know, whatever. And it didn't. We had a down quarter. E-commerce was down this summer. And it fucked me up, dude. Damn. I didn't have the cash flow. I didn't have uh, the resources I needed. I grossly underestimated, you know, what was going to come in. And we also have delayed accounts receivable. We are not going to get paid on some some POs for 120 days. And it's hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't just open up my bank account and see how much money we have to spend anymore. I'm going to fuck this up. And I need a solution. And that's when I profit first. And I'm like, oh, my God. Systems, really? systems, systems. So I tested it out with you know my holding company. And then once I saw how powerful it was and how easy it was to manage, I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that, dude. I need to do that for sure. Like, I, like, it's funny. Me and Christian just last night, uh, we were sitting on the phone because we, that's funny. It's like, we don't, we obviously like are both remote, but I mean, like we FaceTime and just sit here and just like talk and like get shit done together yeah, like, all totally. the time. And I was like, you know what? We really need to just make some really good, like new year's resolutions. Like we've learned a lot this last year, like doing this full time. Like, why don't we sit down for like two hours and really reflect on all our biggest like wins and losses that yes. happened this year. And then going forward into 2022, have a very clear outline of like what we want to focus on, what we don't want to focus on, what we should be, you know, putting money toward or not putting money into like whatever. Um, and I just, I, I like that. I, I, I want to read profit first though, before we have that meeting so we can really have it from a, uh, that, that perspective. Hell yeah, dude. I like that. Yep. Anytime you need a book recommendation, dude, be like, Hey bro, send me another book. Like I've got so many, I can send your way, dude. So many, I love and it. I will only I send it. you the impactful stuff. Fuck the self-help books that you already know the answers to those questions. Right. We right, want to right. learn new techniques. We want to learn new skills. That's what I really love about all this reading stuff. Sam, Sam. Hell yeah, dude. Well, sounds good, man. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, I agree. My stomach is killing me right now. I think it's because all the damn. This is my third okay. cup of coffee. Tell so everybody where they can find you really quick before you go. Oh, totally. Everyone, you guys can find me at Austin Hankwitz on TikTok or austinhankwitz.substack.com or um austin hang what's on twitter or just google my name and i'll be there and Find this oh, guy. or you can you can text me uh 615-802-9495 i text everybody back there's 400 people in there it's a big texting community that we've got uh through community.com and it's awesome so join that if you want uh, about two or three times a week i'll i kind of reshare maybe a tiktok that i found or a tiktok i posted that i liked a lot or perhaps a thing on Substack that I had posted that I think everyone should read. But regardless, I'm super accessible and I'm here for everybody. Okay, Austin. Thanks for hanging out with me, bro. Have a great day. Love you, brother. See you, man. Thank you, man.